We have our last panel with three uh, professors from the Slavic department uh, at the University of Michigan. Um, let me introduce them to you. Um, I will introduce them by order, alphabetical order. So the first is uh, Mikhail Krutikov, professor of Slavic languages and literatures and Tisch professor of Judaic studies at the University of Michigan. He's the author of several books of Yiddish literature and um, analysis of Yiddish authors, Marxism and the Soviet period. Then Benjamin Paoloff, who's professor of Slavic languages and literatures uh, and of comparative literature at the University of Michigan. He's also the director of CREES, the Center for Russian, East European and Eurasian Studies. Uh, in addition to his scholarly work on interwar uh, Eastern Europe. He has published poetry collections and has translated several Polish novels. And last but not least, Svitlana Rogovic uh, is a lecturer in the Department of Slavic Languages and Literature, where she directs the Slavic language program and is the advisor of the minor of, uh, in Ukrainian language, literature, and culture program. So uh, we welcome your remarks, the three of you concluding remarks about um, the war in Ukraine, and perhaps you've had the chance to listen in on um, what some of your um, colleagues said earlier. But we also have um, other speakers present, so this is meant to be more of a roundtable, the end. So I don't know who, which of you wants to start and, and share reflections. Perhaps we just go in the order in which I introduce the speakers. Misha? Okay. Yes, uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes. Very good. Yes, uh, I couldn't, I wasn't able to participate to listen to all the um, speakers. And uh, so maybe I'll say something that has already been said, but I think I'll take a slightly different angle. And what I want us to do is to take and try and take a really, very really long perspective, a kind of metaphysical angle on uh, trying to understand the mindset, which is not necessarily a rational way of understanding, but, but try to kind of understand what's underlying it in terms of uh, really quite deep, I would say, mythological, metaphysical structures. And this is a concept that I would describe as a 1,000 year Rus, and this would be similar to 1,000 year Reich. Uh, there, uh, there are a lot of, uh, of course, uh, references being made to uh, the Soviet Union, to the Russian Empire, that this is an attempt to continue the policies and maybe to restore it. But I think deep down, there is this um, idea that Russia, contemporary Russia, is the legitimate heir to the medieval Kievan Rus uh, principality, which was a conglomerate of about a dozen of principalities between the 10th and 13th centuries on the territories of today's Russia, key, uh, Ukraine, and Belarus. And uh, because Russia claims this name to itself, it also claims to be a continuation and the heir of this uh, policy. So I will just quote from the mm, recent sermon by the Russian patriarch Kirill, who said, uh, today, I quote, today the two brotherly people, peoples entered a conflict. But in fact, they are the same Russian people. So we have two peoples, but this is one people, and this is Russian people. Why is it Russian people? Because Rus is one country, and clear reference to the Kievan Rus, one people. So what does it mean that this one people? But this people has turned out to be very strong. And the neighbors, scared by strength, started doing everything to split this people, to convince some parts of this people that you are not one and the same people. In other words, anything that uh, somehow acknowledges or asserts that, that you, Russians and Ukrainians are two different peoples is the work of the enemy. The enemy can be different. And again, I make references to Putin's uh, various historical articles. I have no time to go into a deeper analysis. But the enemies were uh, nomadic tribes of Poles and Pechenegi, if you remember who that was very good for you. Uh, of course, these were Poles, these were Austrians, these were Na Na Nazi Germany, it's NATO, but it's basically one and the same metaphysical enemy that attacked, has always been attacking and will attack. In this sense, it's not really important where you call them Nazi or you can call them, come up with some other name, you can call them nationalists, but they are enemies and these are the enemies who work against their uh, unity. So Russia cannot fight against Ukraine and 
when you have, you remember there was a quote in uh, uh, Russian Prime Minister, Russian, I'm sorry, Foreign Minister Lavrov uh, saying uh, yesterday at the press conference, we didn't invade Ukraine because there is no, uh, we, uh, yeah, we, we have no plans to invade other countries. We didn't invade Ukraine. And we did not invade Ukraine. We have to understand this logic. I mean, we, it, it is a big effort, but I think unless we understand this logic, we cannot really understand what's driving not only Putin, but I think a lot of people in Russia, because I think that kind of concept is really shared by many, many people, even though they don't really articulate it that way. They don't really acknowledge it because Ukrainian people, it doesn't exist, but it cannot exist. If you say it exists, you are the enemy. So uh, in this sense, I think I'm very pessimistic because it is perceived as a kind of mannequin eternal struggle between that kind of imaginary 1,000 years that always has and will have uh, enemies and it will always have to defend itself. And in this scheme of things, of course, and this was uh, certainly the case in the Middle Ages, Kiev has a very deep symbolic uh, significance because this is the mother of Russian cities, uh, cities, the mother of cities of Rus, as it was originally stated. But now it is the mother of Russian cities. So unless I think this concept, which definitely needs i think more research more understanding but this is something you can see and i think there was a good uh, article by um, michael ziger in the new york times i think yesterday or two days ago where he said that putin lives doesn't live in the present he lives in the past uh, in many ways uh, people putin and many people unfortunately live in that kind of imaginary mythological uh, past yeah i think that's all i had to say thank you actually this is very very helpful um for our students actually who don't understand basically the attachment so there's repression of ukraine for wanting to be other than russia to be independent and sovereign um, because of this mythology around kiev and rus thank you ben yeah so thank you uh genevieve uh misha for your comments svetlana for the comments you're about to make um and everyone i've actually been it's been my 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 pleasure i'm using that term loosely to have, okay. to have, uh stayed on for the entire program of this teaching and it has been extremely uh well um well put together and um and i'm not going to add too much i have to say uh, especially because I actually want us to move as quickly as possible to hear from uh, Svetlana Ragovic, uh, who uh, has a very deep personal connection to uh, Ukraine uh, and to uh, the situation that we're, we're witnessing, uh, and certainly far more so than, than I do, since I, my interest is largely um, academic. Although, nevertheless, as I've been looking at uh, military maps, and or 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 the best uh, information we have about military movement over the last couple of weeks, and it has been, uh, I think, as it has been for for many of us, a daily, hours long, mind numbing drain of just trying to follow the information. I of course keep coming across the name of uh, the uh, the small town in the Cherkasy region where my own uh, family um, fled uh uh russian uh, uh administrative uh, oppression and uh and local ukrainian discrimination frankly um uh, uh as a jewish family over 100 years ago coming to the united states so this is an area with a rather rich history of um of uh inter-ethnic interracial uh tension and uh and and a, and a history that has helped shape uh the united states generally and uh and the upper midwest in very very powerful specific ways and I think it's important to to um, to mention that um, two things that I do think I want I, I want to make sure we have on the table for discussion before we move on to uh, Svetlana's remarks are um, are pedagogical and since this is a a, a teach in I want to, to make sure I emphasize these these two uh, items one hearkening back to Professor uh, Porter uh, Such's uh, remarks on on race uh, though I, I agree with everything uh, Professor uh, Porter said about uh, uh, the racial politics of uh, refugee aid in Poland and especially along the Belarusian border and what I take to be very, very shameful behavior of the Polish government with regard to uh, Middle Eastern and North African refugees. 
the, that, that racial dimension is very much there. Nevertheless, when we use the term race, or for that matter, when we use terms like nation or nationalism in the United States, these terms are, we are tend to be distorted by the uh, myopia of our political context. In the United States, we use the word nation to refer to a state, right? We refer to the United States as a nation, which is not the way we use the word nation typically in uh, political philosophy. And it's certainly not the way that ter the term narod in Russian or narod in Polish or, or related languages uh, is understood. Nation is understood as race or ethnicity in these places. Uh, to be a Jew, for that matter, is to be a different nation from uh, a different nationality, uh, even within, say, uh, Ukrainian or uh, Russian, uh, or for that matter, Polish uh, citizenship. And these things, these ideas of nation or ethnicity are understood very much along the lines of the way um, uh, we are more accustomed to speak about race. Uh, so there, this is a, this is an important point because what Putin is doing, uh, what the Russian military is doing, is a racist assault uh, on the Ukrainian people. Uh, that it has very much the, the uh, features of the ideological features of fascism. But again, in the United States, we refer to fascism typically thinking of it in terms of a destructive, genocidal fascism. Along the sides, uh, side of uh, along the lines of uh, Nazism, and I'm not claiming at all that what you what the Russian military is uh, doing in Ukraine is not uh, potentially genocidal. Certainly, war crimes seem to be occurring left and right. Um, but I do want to suggest that when we re refer to uh, that uh, action uh, in or discussed in terms of fascism, it's not the same fascism. It is not a fascism with the intention of obliterating Ukrainians from the territory of what is uh, today the state of Ukraine. Um, it is a, a form of fascism that completely obliterates the identity category of Ukrainian and absorbs all Ukrainians by redefining them as Russians in disguise. Um, and uh, and I don't want to, I just want to make sure that we're aware of this and we're discussing this among our students, anything that I'm saying here, if you have questions about this for the students who are watching, please ask your professors, because these are important distinctions. One other category distinction I want to make is liberal. Again, in the United States political discourse, it's very easy for us to get absorbed into this idea that liberal is the opposite of conservative. That's not, again, the case in, uh, in, in, in political philosophy. It is, uh, and, it, and it doesn't help us think about what's going on with Russia and Ukraine right now. Liberal in political philosophy simply means recognition of the valid claims of multiple constituencies. You can be liberally conservative, right? Uh, as long as you recognize the uh, seat of other conservatives at the table. And what we're witnessing with Russia and Ukraine right now is a struggle not just between Russia and the West or between one idea of national belonging and another, but is actually a conflict between uh, uh, political liberalism, that is a Western doctrine that recognizes minority groups as having an equal seat at the table, even if they're not in the majority, versus authoritarianism that says there's only one way, only one way to be Russian, only one way to lead, only one way to have power, only one way, and it happens to be our way, and authoritarianism will almost always bring violence into the mix as its primary tool of political transformation. So these, I, I wanna keep these terms, liberal, race, national, nationalism, nation, keep them in the air, keep them in the conversation, because it is important, if we're going to think seriously about what's going on in this part of the world, it is important that we are able to step out of the oversimplifications of our own national discourses and the terms we use in them. Thanks very much. Thank you, Benjamin. Thanks for these conceptual clarifications. And now, Svetlana Rogovic. Uh, yes, hello. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jean-Marie, for uh, organizing, first of all, this teaching. It's a wonderful, wonderful idea. And fortunately, I wasn't able to uh, participate or listen to previous um, speakers. I had a class to teach. 
But um, even though we did not prepare our conclusion remarks, um, it seems to be that was a good order that we decided to, like, like we speak it right now at conclusion. Because my, uh, I would like to speak and use and, and, and uh, explain my point of view on the war in Ukraine actually will be based on understanding the truth and power, just the way Benjamin uh, brought up this particular um, uh, question or point. Uh, Lately, um, in my several already speeches during the protest, um, I have realized that the most important principle uh, to build up understanding of this horrific war in Ukraine is to know and to speak the truth um, in accordance with facts and reality of the moment. Um, in addition to war with firearms, um, there is definitely uh, also information and knowledge warfare. And this war proves that modern Ukrainian society has become an example of society that fights for recognition of its attitudes, of its prospects, its needs. Um, it is true and clear now that um, Ukrainian attitudes, meanings, and prospects are completely different from its aggressor. And that is why Ukraine, even temporarily occupied, will not and never fit into the uh, or Russian world. So what are those principles? Or what are these pr principles and meanings for Ukrainians? So speaking of, you know, being Ukrainian, definitely I would like to uh, speak from the Ukrainian point of view. So like in any society, these abstract terms combined uh, are equal to knowledge of history, culture, language, generally speaking. But there are more to it when I speak of Ukraine today, especially now, especially in time of war. So the truth Anna, is, yes. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Can you speak closer to your microphone sometime? Oh, 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 oh. you don't hear it, okay. Well, we yes. hear you, but sometimes, not as well. So I, okay. I want to make sure that we get every word of what you're saying. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, well, that's so better now. The, thank you. So uh, here's the question. So what are these principles and meanings for Ukrainians? Uh, like in any society, as I mentioned, so the abstract terms, uh, these abstract terms combined uh, equal to knowledge of history, culture, language, and so on. But uh, there are more to it when we speak of Ukraine, especially now in time of war. And here's those few uh, points that I, what I mean. The truth is, Ukrainians fight for the principles of dignity, for the right to be valued, for the right to be respected. And this right is the most important principle of true democracy. Therefore, this insane war in Ukraine one day will be used, I believe, as an illustration of understanding of the true democracy. The truth is, the language question was not a cause of this war. Ukrainian society is a multilingual society where, um, where all Ukrainian citizens could speak two or three even four languages, where Ukrainian just simply is a state language. And by the way, now, according to the 2021 Russian Call Center statistics, 73% of citizens of Ukraine do speak Ukrainian language. More than that, Ukrainian citizens whose first language is Russian are being killed in this war by those mm -hmm. supposed to defend them. The next truth. The truth says, Ukraine proved to become a strong democracy because its people know how to live in diverse societies, as we all spoke. And now every member of the society takes responsibility for the fate of Europe and for the whole world, including the future of Russia. And finally, the truth is that the Western world knows almost nothing of Ukrainian state and society. So if the world wants to win this war, it needs to fill in this gap and learn and appreciate the true history of Ukraine as a Slavic homeland. Hopefully the University of Michigan will be able to fill in this gap as well and to open one day a permanent professorship position in Ukrainian studies. As we speak, the war in Ukraine is going forward. People are dying. Women and children are being killed. 
many Ukrainian cities are being bombed and destroyed simply because it is Putin's power and not truth being prevailed yet. So this is my message. I'll be more than happy to answer many questions that my students might have on the uh, language policies on language, the language question. So I will, uh, anytime you can definitely uh, contact me so we can have a separate discussion on that topic. And I have uh, also a little announcement. Uh, to make it the more while, while I'm speaking. Uh, there are many students from Ukraine um, on campus right now at the University of Michigan. And this Saturday, tomorrow, I'm actually organizing in my house a little evening for them. So if you know any uh, students from Ukraine or graduate students from Ukraine or full writers or wherever they are, researchers, please let them know. So uh, we will be getting together and just have a little get together in my house tomorrow. Thank you all. Thank you, Svetlana, for opening your home and, and offering support. Um, we will extend, obviously, we were behind because of a technical problem at the beginning of the teaching. We'll extend ten, for 10 more minutes. I know that uh, many of you have to leave. Um, I want to say that the support of Ukrainian students is very important. Um, and I want also to, um, to to, to make sure that we also extend our support to Russian students um, who are also, for many of them, feel victims of their own government. And uh, we have received support, of, not support, reports of students who are feeling, um, who have been intimidated and even threatened uh, on campus because they are Russian. Um, so the situation obviously, I mean, is difficult for Ukrainians. Um, but we need to stay mindful also that, that uh, Russian students are not responsible for what's going on in their home country. I just wanna to, to, to say this. Um, we might want to talk for students listening to us on the linguistic issue, um, because you, you mentioned it Svetlana and there was a question also in the chat. Um, because Russian, uh, because Ukrainian can be close to Polish, and to Russian, and it has led also to colonial and imperial uh, stances toward Ukraine. That oh, it's a dialect of Russian, for example. So can you, can you, as a, a Slavic language expert, tell us actually the difference between Russian and Ukrainian, um, and tell us a bit also about the literature and the the, the long-standing tradition of Ukrainian um, literature. In that language, yeah. Well, that's a that's a lecture. That's a very long topic. Uh, in two and three minutes, <laughs> um, it's almost impossible. But uh, I'll be I'll try to be brief right now just to connect this together. But um, the differences between I would probably say the differences of Ukrainian and other Slavic languages in terms of the differences, you the familiarity and difference in Ukrainian language. Uh, the closest language to uh, that has the most similarities with Ukrainian is actually Belarusian. Mm -hmm. So it has about six. Well, it has about 79, 80 percent of, of uh, uh, comparabilities in lexicon. So yeah, similarities in lexicon. The second uh, language that is similar is actually Polish mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the lexicon again. And uh, Russian it has 68% of similarities in terms of the lexicon and, um, you know, and linguistically speaking. That's one thing. In terms of um, uh, Ukrainian language, and uh, yes, I have noticed that in the chat as being a dialect of Russia. Of course, it's it's been in propaganda for many centuries, not even years in Russian propaganda, and we know it. So speaking of different uh, laws and Valuya Bukas to begin with 300 years ago, and uh, Ukrainian language was always repressed, uh, starting with the beginning of the 16th century. And uh, that's, that's another topic of conversation, but that's a Again, we need to talk history and, and chronology and so on. Um, uh, as of um, literature, Ukrainian uh, high literature has been developed also the centuries and, and uh, definitely, you know, we have been teaching so many uh, literature courses in Ukrainian 
during the uh, Ukrainian literature of poetry, by the way. I just remember uh, teaching Shevchenko poetry course about a few years ago. We had 80, just, just monography course. We had about 80 students sign up for just Ukrainian uh, national poets. Uh, monography course, which is also, which speaks to it, right? So people are interested. But as I mentioned before as well, we really need to fill in the gap of knowing about Ukraine more uh, before we start comparing or just discussing separate issue of language, a separate issue of literature and so on. History, that's what we have to talk about more. Thank you. Um... The, uh, Christopher Loveless is, is replying to clarify my question about the Ukrainian language. I was asking how someone who claims that Ukraine and Russia are one nation would view the reality that Ukrainian is a different language. Oh, maybe I can try to speak. Yes. This. Well, we are talking about two very different things. It's mythology and reality. And the way uh, Ukraine is conceptualized in perceived in Russia has really very little to do with reality. There are certain facts that uh, it is based on, like historical facts, but they're all interpreted in a very different way. Um, if we try to kind of reconstruct this idea, then I think Ukrainian language can only exist together with Russian, coexist with Russian. In a sense that Ukraine, one of the demands of the Russian uh, of Putin, well, there are many demands and they keep changing, but one of them is to make Russian another, the other state language, which would mean that Ukrainian will be in a secondary status, um, similarly, I think, how it was in Belarus, but we're not going into the discussion. So in the Tsarist Empire, it was perceived as a language that would be good for peasants, maybe for children, for folklore but it is not a serious language. So if you want really to be an educated modern person, you have to switch into Russian language. So Ukrainian can exist somewhere and it perhaps it's a product of that split because the split goes very, very deeply. So historically they'll always, the enemies, you know, the Poles who invented or the Austrians who invented this language, who imposed this language. And now we have to kind of bring people back. That's, that's the kind of logic that as far as I understand it. Again, we are not talking about reality and we are not talking um, even about uh, different kinds of propaganda, you know, that uh, Russia was uh, defending or protecting Russian speakers. Of course, it wasn't because uh, there were so many Russian speaking against Russia. So it, it, it only works as part of that kind of weird mythological scheme. And the strength of that scheme, which I'm trying to say, is precisely because it defies any normal logic. And that's why it works. Thank you. Thank you. Very important clarification. We have one question by uh, Emilia Ascari who raised her hand. So, Emilia, you may ask your question. Thank you. Um, I teach environmental and public health journalism at the University for Context. And my question is, as this conflict continues, um, what are the stories that you wish journalists should be writing um, or um, preparing um, beyond the daily updates from the war zones? Thank you. Who wants to take this on? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll at least take a stab at it. I mean, first of all, I want daily updates from the war zones. And actually what I especially want from journalists is, uh, is some degree of on, on the ground reporting, um, uh, including video. It's a little surprising actually how much, how little uh, live video there is, um, given how interconnected we are and how we have webcams and we're all on video right now. Um, and, and yet it's, uh, it's, it, it would be wonderful if journalists could give people at home a view of what it looks like on the ground in real time. Um, now, there are reasons why some journalists are reluctant to do that, because it hasn't been vetted and there, it doesn't provide context. And there are places on the web where you can find live webcams from Ukraine. I check them all day, every day, uh, but they don't really show much and they're quite far removed from combat areas. Um, I think it's important for the world to see what's happening on the ground uh, in, in real time. Uh, and that has been an important uh, feature of war reporting in the past. It just hasn't really been coming out of Ukraine quite yet. That's something I would, I would very much like to see more of. 
um, you, I'll just add to it, um, Ukrainian media stations, all TV stations right now combined in one, and they are actually going live uh, and reporting from every stage and on everything. So you can find them on YouTube. They're reporting all of the news with pictures and, um, you know, and videos from France, from um, uh, refugees, from the border with Poland, everywhere you can think of, and you could see very clear pictures. So everything is in YouTube live, uh, going every day, um, just simply open Ukraine news, uh, but in Ukrainian, of course, and, the, and they started to dive it. So it's already with English subtitles, the majority of those. Uh, you know, so as uh, probably as I spoke before uh, from journalists here, we would love to Oh, you, oh, we would love to, all the people in the world would like to hear the truth, just simply the truth. I think we can put some of the links uh, to Ukrainian TV stations if you have a minute, uh, yes. Lana. Mm -hmm. um, and also perhaps we will, we will, um, we have several links that are important in the chat. We will save the chat and make sure that we provide those links either on our website or um, under the YouTube when we post the, the teaching okay. on YouTube. Um, I don't know if, um, Emilia, one of your questions was related to this issue of nu nuclear plants and nuclear power. I mean, I, I know that that's what I'm most concerned about. Well, not most, I'm concerned about people, of course. But um, I think that we need to have experts explaining what it means when there's a fire in a nuclear plant that's being contained. Um, most people don't understand, like myself, we don't really know how much, how many nuclear plants active, inactive, how many, how much nuclear waste there is in that region of the world and what that might mean during wartime if uh, the Russian take control of one versus another, etc. I mean, I think that's very concerning. And it's not just information about this that we need, it's actually experts telling us what those do and what, what, what might happen uh, if they are affected by, uh, by military um, events. Um, we have here uh, a comment that Anna Polbaum described what Russians did to the Ukrainian intellectuals in the Ukrainian uh, language during the Stalin uh, rule that explains a lot. Um, at this point, if there's no immediate questions, uh, I will ask if you have one, you know, last thoughts um, and we'll thank our speakers, those on the panel now, but also the ones we had earlier this morning, including Ron Suni, Yevgenia Albats, Ambassador Dan Fried, Yuri Zhukov, Brian Portuschutz, Jessica Zehovich. Um, any last thoughts or? Um, I want to thank everyone, everyone also who came to the teach-in, faculty, friends of the University of Michigan, alum, and especially students. We hope that this was um, a helpful, instructive, informational event. I want to thank the staff of the Wiser Center for Europe and Eurasia for putting this, this together. It's a lot of work. Thank you so much. Could not do it without you. And we will be posting this on um, our YouTube channel very soon. Uh, we're also posting all Ukraine related events on campus on the WCEE website. There's a Ukraine button. So we're constantly updating this as soon as we hear of anything related to Ukraine. And we're also posting our faculty's media appearances or publications on that site so that uh, you can refer to this to see what your colleagues or your professors are writing about. Um, I have no other words than actually thinking of uh, Ukrainians in Ukraine and uh, outside of Ukraine. 
In an hour, I'm going to pick up one Ukrainian sociologist who's coming for a few weeks as a WCEE fellow, professional development fellow, and we will um, bring some more. Uh, we're working on bringing some more um, later uh, this summer, hopefully. So thank you everyone and uh, goodbye. And thank you everyone for the work you're doing at the university. Thank you.